Hello, everyone. I'm Tom McDonald with the CIO Executive Council, and welcome to the November 2nd, 2017 edition of the Power Hour. Today's session is Profiles and Innovation, and we've assembled a great panel of IT leaders who have the actual word innovation in their title to lead today's conversation. And I'm particularly proud of myself for organizing that, and really, what could be better than that? So, uh, But before we get to them, I have just a couple of quick housekeeping items as everyone's dialing in and logging in. Uh, this is an interactive session, and if you're logged into the Adobe platform, we encourage you to post any questions or comments you may have in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll uh, look at those and do our best to work those into the conversation throughout. We'll also look to save a little time at the end, and uh, be sure to type what you want to get answered in there. Also, you can keep an eye on that for any relevant links or info that uh, we come across. Our producer, Robin Clausen, will post that there if we have something that you'll uh, want to check out afterwards or during the session. And now we can get to our panel. All right, here's our panel today, and I'd like to introduce each of them and have them tell us a little bit about themselves and what innovation means to them. So uh, first up is Mike Molinari. Mike, why don't you tell our uh, audience today a little bit about yourself, your organization, and what does innovation mean to you? Sure, thanks very much. Um, Mike Molinari, I'm Senior Manager for Strategic Innovation and Emerging Technologies. Uh, I work for Universal Parks and Resorts, and we're the company that operates the Universal Studios theme parks worldwide. Um, I, I work on a dedicated innovation team, and our focus is on using technology to make the theme parks awesomer, which is a pretty, pretty wide um, spectrum of opportunities. But uh, our real focus is on guest experience, improving the way we operate the parks, and on uh, finding ways to bring new technologies into the fold and roll them out in a, in a theme park environment and keep pushing the envelope. Excellent, excellent. I like more awesomer. That's, I think it was just awesomer, not more awesomer. That would be redundant. So next we have uh, Steve Heindel. Steve, and, uh, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your organization, and what innovation means to you? Yeah, good afternoon, good morning, depending upon what time zone you're in here. So my name is Steven Heindel. I work for Holman Automotive Group. I've been with the organization for nine years. Uh, Holman Automotive Group now is called Holman Enterprises, and it's a family-owned business. It's been around for 93 years. So as you can imagine, a company that's been around this long, they've done a few things well to make sure they've survived recessions, uh, technology change, whatever it might be. So a big part of, of home and enterprises is making sure we're around for another 93 years. We're going from our third to our fourth generation. And part of our corporate values is to invest and reinvest in people, process, technology, and data. So what does innovation mean to me? It means to experiment. Um, we're allowed to fail. We're a learning culture, and we look for new opportunities. Part of our culture is to do things for the long run. We have a family mentality. So as I said, we're looking for the next generation. And innovation isn't only our responsibility, but it's our duty for our survival for future generations. So it's something that we're uh, born and bred with here and quite excited to talk to the rest of the team about today. Fantastic. 93-year-old family-owned company. That's terrific. All right. Next, we want to go to Randy Gabriel. And Randy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your organization, and uh, what innovation means to you. Great. Thanks, Tom. Randy Gaborio, and I am the Chief Information Officer as well as the Senior Vice President for Strategy, Strategic Development, and Innovation at a health system on the front line of provider care. We fall into that band of around one of the 20 largest health systems in the nation. Uh, and Tom, simply put, uh, innovation in itself is about relevance, and uh, you know, on top of that, it's really it's really about cultural and transformational work for an organization. And then, you know, in my view, it's one of those things that if we really only cared about the outcome, it's something you could outsource. So it's really for us about driving a, a relevant transformation for the future. Excellent, that's great, Randy. And I'd like to stick with you for our first uh, segment here. Um, and we want to get beyond the buzzword and talk a little bit about the discipline of innovation and what types of processes and frameworks you might employ to achieve outcomes. And so maybe uh, one, of, one element of this is how do you structure your team? You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So interestingly, I think, right, you can, um, depending on the problem you're solving. So, and for us, innovation begins with a sort of this concept of unmet needs. And at the same time, uh, you know, I'm on the front line of an industry that's at a, you know, a historic juxtaposition where there's innovation in scientific technology, and at the same time, 
probably some of the greatest challenges that, that exist in, in organization and in finance. You know, around the context, of, you know, somewhere in the range of in, in American healthcare, 30% of all health spending is wasted, meaning it doesn't benefit the patient. So, uh, so for us, you know, creating an innovation capability is specifically around getting at, at those problems and, uh, and as well as uh, adapting to how, how are we going to engage with what is known as a, a patient and then that transformation of patient as a consumer. So as, as a result of that, we, um, we developed an innovation team several years ago focusing on uh, the evolution of sort of digital transformations uh, in the environment, but that team itself uh, originated inside IT, and it, it lives in such a structure whereby it effectively uh, doesn't report necessarily sort of through a traditional structure of saying uh, IT and combating for traditional IT resources. It's a team that's made up of different skill sets, and that team, the real role of that team is that it really actually works with folks on the sort of the front line of the organization, those folks that are closest to problems, closest to opportunities, those that actually can, uh, are experiencing barriers. And that team lives in the wild and actually helps sort of prosecute what is the unmet need or the problem or the obstacle to then work with those folks to actually develop a solution that uh, is sustainable, one that actually removes those barriers, uh, doesn't sort of threaten um, sort of the objective of the work itself. Um, and that team is, is made up of developers, analysts, and you can have multiple types of skill sets. I mean, you, know, you, you could land with a physicist and a journalist and other folks as they sort of help you think about that from a, from a perspective. So our team lives as a separate structured innovation team um, that reports up through me as the CIO, uh, but it works directly on the front line of the business. It isn't really disconnected in the background. It lives in the wild. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Randy. And Mike, uh, let's let's turn to you. And you know, when talking about processes and frameworks, uh, maybe talk a little bit about how you structure your team, and maybe also touch upon uh, how do you fund these teams? Yeah, absolutely. So in the in the theme park industry, um, one of the challenges that we have from a technology standpoint is that many of the solutions that we buy or products are built for uh, similar industries, but not necessarily for our industry specifically. So we buy a lot of solutions that go into uh, sports stadiums, arenas, things that were designed more for shopping malls, and our physical environment is a lot different from that. And so um, as a way to address that, our IT team has created, you know, our strategic innovation team whose focus is really on, you know, exploring new technologies, products, things that we're not currently doing in the theme parks, and finding ways to burn down risk um, and to understand how we can get them into the theme parks because most of the organization does a really good job with delivering projects once they have a defined scope, schedule, budget. You know, you've got a vendor lined up in a lot of cases. And when things are less tangible, it, when you're working at the fuzzy front end of, of how are we going to do this, and before you really have a project to put on the table, that's when our team really gets involved to, to put definition around things. We do a lot of pilots, proofs of concepts, et cetera. Um, much like Randy was saying, we have, a, we have a dedicated but small innovation team that rolls up under the IT department. Um, and, you know, we're about 1% to 2% the size of the overall department. So, you know, we're about a half a dozen people right now. So not a, not a very big team, but really focused on strategic projects and, and trying to have a large business impact. Um, from a funding standpoint, funding is actually really, really um, important for this type of activity because if you're going to take risk, um, you have to be prepared to to win some and lose some. And so you need to be able to invest money in projects that you can afford to lose, which a lot of organizations don't like to do when you go to the finance department and ask for funding. Um, you know, they, they, they want to ask what they're going to get for the money they're going to give you, and they want to make sure that they get it. And so it takes some courage to to, to give some sort of unstructured money to an innovation team um, that gives them the opportunity to fail. So we typically do smaller projects out of our team budget, which we have a lot more discretion to do and where we can afford to sort of fail. Um, and then when we move on to larger projects, then we'll go out and fund those on a per-project basis. Uh, but they tend to be further along in the innovation chain when we have more confidence in them 
and when we're trying to drive more towards getting things into production, um, and we can be more accountable. Right, that makes sense. Uh, Steve, I'd like to turn to you with the same question, uh, you know, types of processes and frameworks you do, that you employ, um, how do you structure your team, maybe a little bit on funding, and then uh, if you had anything to add to those points, but uh, I also wanted to particularly ask, uh, how do you evaluate the performance of the teams and uh, maybe the individuals themselves? Is there any speci special methodology for innovation teams that uh, you employ? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so let me give you a little bit more background on Holman Enterprises. We're broken up into three different um, teams or organizations, for lack of better terms. So Holman Consumer, that's our retail dealership network. We have about 40 dealerships throughout the country. We also have insurance services that does retail and commercial and financial services that supply funding to a dealership network. So that's a more traditional business. When we look at the past 93 years, that's where the retail business, the financial services, is several decades old, and insurance for us is fairly new. Then there's home and business, which is made up of um, business-to-business type functionality, and there's the fleet management business. We're the, private, we're the largest privately held fleet management company in the world. We service over a million and a half vehicles throughout the globe, and we have partnerships in areas that, um, that we don't necessarily have boots on the ground. We also have an upfitting a portion of the business that does engineering, manufacturing, and fabrication. So there's some interesting things we do and parts distribution. And then the last business uh, segment I want to mention is Holman Strategic Ventures. So out of this team here, we, we work on a lot of incubation of ideas and startups. So the Holman consumer business is what I would call more mature and established. And the innovation that we do is via partnerships uh, and working with other dealers. So one of the things within this business model is you can't necessarily corner the market. You might build, build something, be first to market, but eventually it's going to be replicated and duplicated throughout the industry. In home and businesses, it's, it's a little bit different. So we're, we're more of an oligopoly. There's only a, a handful of competitors, although there are some of new competitors that are, that are trying to jump in in this space, specifically Verizon and some of the tech startups. So we do a lot of, let's just say, incremental innovation. We work with our customers um, as well as suppliers and other partners, and we have a whole dedicated team with, within information technology called Customer Information Systems, and we're willing to experiment with, with pretty much everyone. So we'll make investments. In some cases, we know that just we're building bridges to nowhere, and in other cases, they're going to provide a lot of value. So back to... How, how do we evaluate that performance? We can see those types of investments that get adapted. We also can see the ones that don't. But the beauty of that, it gives us optics into all sorts of different types of businesses and industries, and we learn what, what works and what doesn't. So, and, and with Home and Strategic Ventures, that is more like a VC type of, of organization. We're working with incubating ideas and startups. What we did in this part of the business is we've taken – about 15, 10 to 15 people, um, primarily technology professionals, but we also took financial services professionals and, and retailing professionals that complement our other two businesses. And we're building products and services that really combined the skills and assets that we have in, in, in home and consumer and home and business. We've also partnered with a couple of other significant automotive industry players so if, if I could draw a Venn diagram and have the intersections, we have, they have their assets, we have our assets, we see where they might merge or complement each other, and then we take almost like a blue ocean approach. We're going after gaps in the market and marketing the gaps to build products and services that others just don't have or there's a need. So look, look at us as doing kind of combination and uh, connecting. Uh, it, since it's the Halloween season, my favorite combo type of invention was the Reese's peanut butter cut, where we're just putting chocolate and peanut butter together. And in a way, that's what this team is doing. But, but the types of individuals that are on this team, they are very seasoned professionals. I mean, we have actually the person who ran development in IT uh, for, for almost 15 years is on this team. His successor is on this team the person that was responsible for all the retail uh, dealership network from an IT standpoint are, is on this team. We have some of our top developers. 
we've, we've also partnered with universities. So in some cases, um, we're, we're teaching with universities, and we brought some, um, some, some professors and some doctors in to help us and work with us. So we're, we're looking for just a good cross-section of ideas, and, and we're willing to experiment. Excellent. Thanks so much. And you know, we talked a little bit about um, the individual's performance, uh, to evaluate an individual's performance, and when would you do that? When and how do you evaluate that? I think you mentioned uh, the nine-box model. Is that, is that something? Yeah, I mean, doing? if you look at not the GE's nine-block model, so you're looking at performance and potential. A lot, of the, a lot of the initiatives that people are working on don't necessarily have a direct impact to the bottom line unless it goes out of the incubation stage into the startup and then you're actually generating profit. So in those cases, yeah, we're, we're using that model. So you look at performance and potential and, the, and, and all the players that are on that team get evaluated and viewed by those other business leaders. That way, at least they get a good idea. Once again, they get optics in what they're doing. It's just not this black hole of, of investment that's going on. And potentially, there's some ideas that can be replicated or generated and brought back to the other parts of the business. So we've seen a tremendous amount of value. Just some things that have been incubated that might not have legs in home and strategic ventures, but they grow legs in other parts of the business. Excellent. Randy, I'd, I'd like to circle back to you while we're in this segment still and uh, see if you had anything to add about uh, evaluation, uh, evaluating the team's performance and what maybe a career path might look like for someone on an innovation team. Do you have anything to, that can speak to that? And also the other piece, I guess, would be it's how do you incentivize that, the folks on that team? Yeah, Tom, this is, this is really interesting. The, the, one of the things, in order to get people to try new things that have risk, um, you have to create a sort of a zone uh, of safety for people because typically in most organizations, you know, taking on something that might not work is usually not sort of the pathway upward. Doesn't create, typically doesn't create a lot of mobility for people. And so we've had to completely sort of rethink and uh, change the cultural thinking uh, about this type of work that's sort of pushing us into white space and a new future. And so typically around moving to the sort of being able to celebrate, uh, you know, celebrating failure uh, for initiatives, but the real key for us, you know, beyond this sort of this language, okay, we celebrate failures, we've really had to actually sort of reward people, not for how quickly we create some new innovative solution or process uh, that impacts our customers and our patients, but much more around as we, as we undertake these investments and these initiatives, how quickly can we learn from them and then pivot from them? And that's been a complete shift because as we do that, our innovation team doesn't actually work as an island, right? You have to actually work with people in the business who are trying to solve for a particular problem. So in order to formulate that partnership, we've had to create this sort of the zone of safety um, and getting people comfortable with that. And at that evaluation, when people look at it and say, this is the number of things we've tried, this is how quickly we learn from them, um, and this is how... Um, you know, then, then separately is the, you know, is the individuals that work on those initiatives from outside and inside as they see that celebration, it picks up a level of steam and you get a much more tactile sort of uh, approach of people who are being very interested in engaging and actually changing their work. And there's one other piece of this to add to that is that when the innovation folks start working with people on the front line, what they can't do is come in there and say, right, oh, my goodness, look how messed up things are in your area, or look. They, they have to come in there uh, kind of as peers together to look at and have a, a willingness to sort of prosecute the way things work um, and then uh, develop, uh, develop a relationship where they're hand-in-hand they're -hand working together and how quickly they can learn together and how quickly they're able to share those learnings and pivot. So, um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of insight. And I forgot the second half of your question, Tom. There was a second half. <laughs> well, I was, I was talking a little bit about how you know what a career path might look like for uh, and uh, someone on that team, on the innovation team itself. So you know, historically, a lot of these folks um, they're they're coming out of development or IT or process analysis uh, type roles. Um, so effectively, um, what we're working on in a couple of ways is looking at and we don't have this uh, you know, prescribed and figured out, 
certain functions that we look at, like the like the, the, the leadership functions that do innovation design, leadership functions that do process design and the like. And what we see is actually bringing people through to spend a period of their career, like to do a year working in the innovation center, doing a year working with these other ones that, 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 that can complement it, create a pathway for those people to be the next generation of managers and leaders. Um, and then we don't prescribe necessarily, in that case, say someone who's going, you know, if we have a cardiac uh, ICU physician who's partnering, right, likely they're going to continue in their pathway. But the folks that would rotate through or that work in there from an IT perspective, um, they're interested in obviously developing into managerial leadership functional roles. Uh, and our objective there is to create ones that not necessarily are exclusively inside IT, but create an ability to move and translate sort of a porous nature inside and outside IT. So next generation managers, and then from a talent perspective, the organization might look at that, you know, that top 100 or top 200 or whatever the percentages in the size of your organization at that talent, and then actually take control of those individuals' careers and then determine from that perspective, it makes sense for these folks to do a rotation here and then to do a rotation somewhere else. And then it frees them up for them to manage an opportunity to say, this person has demonstrated, and maybe kind of got something like Steve John Box model. You have individuals that will actually vouch and will stand behind and say, "I'll take that person on my team." All right, terrific. Thanks, Randy. Uh, we've had a few questions come in from our audience, and I think uh, we'll we'll get to them right now because a lot of them are related to what we were just talking about. Uh, so, Mike, if you want to chime in on this, but also Steve and, and Randy, um, if you have an opinion, I'll I'll give you first crack at it, Mike. Uh, can you speak to, if you have separate innovation and operation teams, how you transition in and innovation into day-to-day -day operations? Yeah, that's an awesome question, and it's actually one of the most critical things, and, and it can be one of the most difficult things to do from an innovation standpoint. Uh, what we've found to be very successful is, you know, as IT, um, we are a service provider to the rest of the organization. So we provide IT to the marketing team. We provide IT to the park operations teams. And, and so when we're working on innovation, um, you know, at the beginning of the call you were talking about how do you define innovation, and I would have defined it as um, you know, combining a business problem with a technology or process solution to create you know, real business impact. And so you know, starting with that business problem is really, really important. And in order to really transition things into day-to-day -day operations, what we do to succeed is to really begin with operations, right, is start working with them at the beginning to make sure that you're working on a real problem that they have, and then as you're developing the solution, to continue to work with them to make sure that the solution that you're working on meets the, the problem that they have and really make them an advocate for what you're doing. And if you're able to do that, then you know they're pulling the solution out of the innovation team, not the innovation team pushing it onto the operations team, because you know it, it's it's a really great place to you know to be a, a problem looking for a solution potentially, or at least it's a much better place to be there than to be a solution looking for a problem, and I, you know that's that's kind of a danger place you can get into is if you if you dream something up in the innovation team and try to to throw it over to the operations team. Um, you can be really setting yourself up for failure. So bringing them in very early and making sure that the things that you're working on from the get-go are really solving their problems. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Steve, do you, did you want to uh, have anything to add to that if you have separate innovation and operation teams, how you would transition an innovation yeah. into day-to-day -day operations? So what we, we, we've done here is the teams that are separate, and they are separate, they're actually in a, even in a different building than, than us. Um, the, the, the folks that are working on these types of new ideas. But the good news is we, got, we have a good blend of people that actually ran businesses and ran operations that are on that team. So I always looked at this team as you don't do this your entire career. It might be a rotational type of initiative, kind of even like an architecture position. You want to be close enough to the engineering team if we're going to compare this to architecture and, and to operations. Same thing here. Also, if we're getting ready to take an idea from incubation to startup into operations, generally we, we like to have one or two people from that team follow it all the way through. So things don't get lost in translation. Plus, it's also important that team to have an understanding what it takes to truly run and operate. I, I, I always like to refer back to a book that, that, I, that I love, uh, Peter's, P. 
Peter Thiel zero to one, whatever business, whatever business needs to know, notes on startups or how to build the future. And there's seven questions, and we try to ask and answer these through our process. One's the engineering question, are you really building something that's significantly better than before? The timing question, is this the right time? Uh, the monopoly question, are you building something that you, that's truly going to differentiate yourself in, in the marketplace? Or, or in this case, it might be just something that's around efficiency and can help you. The people question, and I think that's part of what you're asking. Do you have the right people? And that's everything to take it from conception to operation. Same thing on the, on the distribution and durability question. And lastly, the secret question, you're doing something that's a little bit different than anybody else. So we like to go through and ask ourselves these questions and see if it's a good asset test for us and making sure that we really can take it from beginning to end. So that's why we like to have that mix of individuals that aren't on, they're both on the innovation team but also can move to the operations team. And once that's up and running, there's, there's nothing stopping from us from pulling them out. Or they just might even from a career change standpoint say, you know what, this is my baby, this is my passion, I built this from the ground up, I just don't want to see this, this go to kindergarten, I want to see this child graduate and go to adulthood, so I want to be a part of this for the rest of my career. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Randy, I had another question from the audience I was going to run by you if you had a take on it. And is, do you have, do, actually it's for everybody, but I'll ask you first, do any of you have other innovation teams working outside of the official innovation team? Would that be shadow innovation team? <laughs> well, here's an interesting perspective on that. They, that I mean, we, we have an official innovation team, but you don't want to necessarily create a, right, a, an air traffic control that says all innovation has to work here. Uh, what we try to do is um, you know, obviously encourage innovations and give people um, a channel to be able to move those things when they run into an obstacle where they need help or where they need resources uh, in doing that. But what's, here's an interesting take on that. What, what gets interesting is one of the things that we've learned as well is that you know, when you take an organization and you basically, you know, ask the question of whose responsibility is innovation, and then you might get an answer, well, everybody's or managers or leaders or this innovation team. One of the things that we've sort of learned is this, this, you, you, this, you have this, this challenge where you have people out in, the, out in the field, if you will, on the front lines that um, have an interest and they see the opportunities, but one of the challenges that they have is they don't ever have necessarily really the capacity that it takes to turn an idea into something, even a proof of concept or experiment or do some degree of, of evaluation on it. So part of what we've um, done is in, you know, encouraging that work in the field uh, and leveraging the innovation team or the resources to become that full-time capacity because there's this constant tension between if you, if you have an idea in the field, but every time your, you, the, the world of your daily life, what's in front of you, will always trump what you could potentially do in creating new ideas. And so what we want to do is when those people have those ideas, that it doesn't just get extinguished because they don't actually have the capacity, is to be able to turn to the innovation team or those resources to be able to then throttle up and can help them do that. And what we can then do as well is help those people. We actually think there's a real potential around this idea as well. We can actually help by working through their leadership to create the capacity in their function to work on the idea as well. Thank you so much, Randy. Excellent. Now we're going to turn. I'm can sorry, I, excuse can me. I that, can I? Yep, please do. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, real quick. So to, to, to dovetail on Randy, we have our own little uh, formal program, which we call Shark Tank here. So it allows different people in the organization to come up with these ideas, get a business sponsor, and then see if it really holds water and let them present. Um, specifically in, in technology, we have developer forums. So once a quarter, we'll get together, and there'll be different people just going off and trying different approaches or developing new, new little products and services or applets where, where they think they can add value. I think that's really important, trying to separate the day-to-day -day and giving people time and, and the opportunity to bet some ideas that could be of tremendous value for the organization. Mike, did you uh, want to chime in? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I had a, a point to sort of build off of what Randy was saying and Steve as well, which is 
uh, when I look at different organizations and how they approach innovation and when they have innovation teams that um, I, I've seen sort of two different models for innovation. One of them is um, the way we approach it here and, and, you know, it sounds like the way Steve and Randy approach it in their organizations as well, which is that the people that are in the innovation team are the ones who are identifying the problems and working on the technology solutions and sort of implementing the innovations. But there's another very common way to implement an innovation team, which is that the people who are on the innovation team, uh, their day job is going out into the organization and identifying people within the organization who have ideas that are innovative and enabling them to implement those ideas. So like Steve was saying, how you have people that with their day job may trump their ability to do the innovation. Um, and there's a lot of organizations where the innovation team, a lot of times they'll have an innovation lab, they'll bring people in from across the company, and they'll find ways to help them think through the problem, uh, find resources to help them implement it, uh, help them work through the design thinking process in a lot of cases. And so it's, it's almost like a different model of implementing um, innovation and sort of scaling it across the organization. And I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, um, although admittedly, like, I, I can't think of an organization where I've seen sort of both coexisting um, at the same time um, in, a, in a kind of pure play like that. But... Uh, but that is an, a, like another way to approach innovation um, that enables you to, to sort of get innovations from people across the company and, and help enable them to, to deliver them into the business. And Tom, I'll, I mean, that's great. And I'll, I'll even add that one, one of the things thinking about as well is, you know, you, you do have great ideas, but you also have people that are working really hard in their functions. And there may be um, disruptions that, that, are, that are taking place. And you look at it, frankly, you know, as much as we look at industries being disrupted, disciplines and functions are being <laughs> disrupted just as much. So at that same time, we talk about, you know, as I said, sort of the, those folks being able to live in the wild, our innovation folks, and getting out. Part of that also is those folks become the scouts um, for disruptive technologies that might affect a discipline or a function and then bring those in and actually help look for um, and create the soil conditions for people to think about potential use cases uh, on how to use that. Um, and that becomes really important uh, as we think about, you know, you know, all the common disruptors of AR and VR and analytics and all these other, uh, all these other aspects. We've got to create a window for people to be able to see these things. So our innovation team has that level of accountability as well is to bring these things. And we may have no idea how a particular uh, technology might might affect it. But we get in and we do the design case, uh, design use case scenarios. Excellent. And these are some great questions from our audience. I much appreciate that. And feel free to keep typing them. I did want to uh, <clears throat> get to our risk tolerance uh, segment. And uh, Mike, I was going to kick it off with you and then Steve and then Randy. Uh, let's talk about risk. And you know, what is an appropriate degree of failure for an organization when you're dealing with innovation? I'm sure there's a much you would assume a lower bar, or how, how does that work uh, in terms of risk tolerance, and is it per industry basis? Uh, Mike, you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, no, risk is a, is a really, really important question, and, and when you're talking about innovation, I think it's one of the questions to ask really, really early on is what is your tolerance for risk? Um, I think people uh, like to think that they're risk takers, but a lot of companies are very, very good at reducing risk. Um, and not and not necessarily taking a, you know appropriate risk, especially in an innovation um, in the innovation space. Uh, you know, one example I give a lot is I spent a lot of time working in the consulting industry for a large consulting firm, and we used to we obviously wrote a lot of proposals and we tracked our win rate religiously. And of course, if your win rate was too low, um, that was a bad thing. But similarly, uh, if your win rate was too high, that was also a bad thing. And the perception was that you either weren't going after enough opportunities or you must be really good at this, so we need to be using you on more proposals. Or, and so they had a very sort of proactive and measured way to manage, to, to manage risk at a level that they felt like was appropriate for the business. And I think that idea of having an appropriate level of risk um, where you know you're going to win some and you know you're going to lose some and having a portfolio of projects where, you know, they're not all – uh, moonshots or lottery tickets, um, but they're also not all just layups. You know, it's like you got to have to have a mix of of projects um, 
There's another way though to, to think about risk, and I, um, I, you know, I saw this graphic once, which I thought was really perfect, and they were using the example of trapeze artists. And in in this image, you have the the one trapeze artist with his leg hooked on the bar, and he's swinging over. And then um, from the other side of the image, there's uh, a, another trapeze artist sort of flying through the air, and this first one is supposed to catch the second one. And if you think about risk, the probability of failure for both of those people is the same, but the risk is very different. And so an important thing in innovation is making sure that um, if you're going to fail, it, it's not so much about failing fast as much as it is about failing as painlessly as possible. Like there's always some pain, but trying to find ways that you can do it where if you fail or when you fail, because you will, that uh, it's not catastrophic for you or for the organization. Um, I think those are both like very important concepts as you're talking about how to, how to approach risk. Excellent. I, I love fail as painlessly as possible. That might be my new motto. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Steve, uh, I think you we were next on that. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your tolerance for risk? Yeah, well, I think an important aspect here is your cult, culture and your investment horizon has a lot to do with your, your, your company. I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate working in a privately held company and that's looking out for the next several generations. So our horizon and our, our propensity to, to accept failure and risk is, is fairly high over a long period of time. If you look at VC funds, I mean, typically you're not going to know how well they do for anywhere from five to ten years. So it really depends as as was talked about before, is this a moonshot? Are we looking for something where we're going to get 10, 20, 30, 40 times return? And, and if you're willing to, to, to take a risk like that, you have to be willing to, to lose. I mean, there's a saying, in order to win big, you might be able to, you have to be able to lose big. And I think the important thing there is doing that calculated risk. So I keep on going back, I'll go back to Teal's book again, is if you are taking that risk, can you answer five, six, seven of those questions, and then do you have the intestinal fortitude to see it through? So it, it, it really comes, to me, it comes a lot, a lot to do with your culture and what your company is willing, willing to do. That's, culture trumps everything, in my opinion. Right. And Randy, I'm going to come to you with the same question. And we talked a little bit about the different types of industry represented on our panel today and, you know, tolerance for risk, health care, I'm assuming you have uh, maybe a different take on that, given your your position or your industry. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, given that you know the the, the people that we're dealing with are you know vulnerable and sick, and, and uh, you know, and actually, right, our objective is to save lives, extend lives, and improve quality of lives. Uh, I think you know, in talking about sort of the risks around sort of governance, the processes. This may sound completely antithetical to the word innovation, but we actually have governance around our innovation. We have actually an innovation governance council, and there's there's no shortage of problems and opportunities that we can self-identify or working across the business that can we that, that we can identify. Part of what this our multidisciplinary governance group does, and when I say multidisciplinary, you know, it includes uh, you know, clinical leaders from different domains. It includes um, um, other functional leaders. It includes folks from different. And we even have, we even have residents uh, as well participating. Our head of HR uh, and our chief people officer participates. And that group, we look at all the opportunities. And our innovation team does that. I mean, they they work the funnel, and then bring the ideas back. They we you know we kind of do an impact times. Uh, you know, per, almost really, we, we look at sort of purpose, impact, and uh, and resources around around those types of innovations, and we actually do a governance scoring of whether it makes sense for this limited capacity that we have on our innovation team. Is this the right place to allocate them? So along the way, that funnel is a de-risking process, um, and by the time we get to one that that, that we say this is this is this is a go. Um, we've also calculated what we think sort of the opportunity to scale those innovations are. And when we, when we take on sort of um, something that we're going to generate de novo inside our organization, uh, we, we have a rubric that we work through of identifying has, you know, has the market solved this problem, can it be solved a different way, uh, and as we get through that process, in the end, if we make a determination that it makes sense that we need to pioneer this innovation, 
We also look at it from the standpoint, is it extensible and scalable beyond our organization? And if so, then we take that approach uh, of, of from the standpoint is do we need to bring patent attorneys in at this point and so forth, and how do we, how do we approach that? So we've had some that have gone down that path, and we've had you know, others that are more incremental solving for a problem that, is, um, that stretches across the organization uh, to solve for that, that, that isn't necessarily going to be uh, extensible beyond our organization in a monetizable fashion. Um, so I know it sounds antithetical, but governance and innovation actually do go hand in hand. Echo, very well laid out, Randy. Thank you so much for that. And I did have another question from the audience. We have a few more uh, planned questions, but uh, this is uh, an interesting one. And Steve, I'm going to read it and see if you can uh, interpret it. Maybe <laughs> tell, and if anyone else has a take on it, we'll start with you, Steve. Innovation within the pace layering model requires a certain level of granularity. How would you overcome monolithic legacy application stacks to support innovation business cases? Can, can you repeat that question, please? Sure. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to speak fully. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation within the pace layering model requires a certain level of granularity. How would you overcome monolithic legacy application stacks to support innovation business cases? Well, I think every company states with monolithic business stacks, we're, we're not trying to get rid of them. We're building around them. Um, so we'll continue to do that. We, we can't make a business case to get rid of some of our just systems that have been around for the last 20, 30 years, and like anything else, you're, you're, you're weighing your portfolio and your capital investment, and that's something the board's doing all the time. What do I do here? So do I invest in paying down debt? Should I buy back my stock? Should I invest in a new market opportunity? Should I upgrade my monolithic platforms? Well, that's why they're coming to people like us to say, is there a different way? Can you build around it? So the approach that we've taken is we, we've been built around it. We, we, we know these platforms are here. They're here to stay. And that's what we do. All right. I, I, can, uh, Tom, I, I can add to, to that just with a thought. Please do. You know, interesting question, uh, but maybe looking at it from the lens of uh, we think about kind of how we invest, and we do a lot of sort of, you know, thinking about how we're managing our energy. We have limited capacity of energy. Uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, in every organization, right? It's, a fi it's technically finite. Um, and when we do, when we look at these sort of um, these deep complexities, you know, and there's these anthropologic layers of legacy and infrastructure that you have to get at, um, my lens on the world is thinking about how much of our capacity of our available energy are we really spending on maintaining our current state and environment? And then I look at it and say, uh, from another lens and say, what are we actually applying our resources, our energy, our capacity around sort of to find sort of these targeted evolutions in our current state? And then I look at this sort of third lens, which is where are we investing our energy, capacity, our resource to create a future state? And, uh, and, and so that's the way there's no, we're not going to flip a switch and say, you know, today we're in this, you know, world. And, you know, you could, some people argue in the lens of, you know, we're even in a post-platform era. Um, but you, you, know, you have to work through those layers, and your organization has to continue to deliver processes day in and day out. Um, so I found for me that lens helps me figure out making sure that we're on an evolutionary as well as simultaneously a transformational journey, that we're supporting, that we're supporting change today and change for tomorrow. Excellent. That's a great answer to a spontaneous question, so I appreciate the panel <laughs> fielding the questions as they come in. Uh, I think we're going to move on here. Steve, I think we we're going to move to you. You had mentioned uh, culture trumps everything, I think was the quote, and uh, was kind of wanted to dig into that. What role does organizational culture and strategy play in innovation? I think culture is your primary concern. It's interesting uh, based upon the question. It looks like we have a Gartner fan out there. But with, with Gartner at their, at their latest expo, and they talked about their symposium, um, the, the biggest challenge everyone has in front of them is, is culture. So it's, it's people, you, you look at the classical uh, data, information, knowledge, wisdom. Well, in some cases, well, that, that's culture in many cases. So how, how do you get an organization to change? How do you get an organization to look at itself 
in the mirror. And a lot of that has to do with just how it's grown up and its, and its willingness to look at things differently. So it's so important to understand the culture. I, I know within our organization being around 93 years, we've got cultures and subcultures. We operate in the retail space. We act, uh, operate in the, in the B2B space. We have offices throughout North America and, and Europe, and all these cultures are different. And it's, it's, it's a constant challenge just understanding the perspectives from different points of views, not to mention the cultures of your, of your customers and the industries that you support. So I, I think it benefits all of us to, as, as we analyze what type of new opportunities that we want to bring to the market that we understand and, and layer it in with the cultures that we support. And it's really important to understand our own. Right. I said, Randy, um, you talked a little bit about the culture. You want to want to elaborate a little bit more on what role it plays in innovation? Yeah, I think even going back to my opening comments, that you know, innovation it's really about cultural change and transformation. Um, and even coming back to the, you know why are we innovating as as well as to the the relevance. And I think my point there, which is you know, if we if we only cared exclusively about sort of the outcome or the result of an innovation, we would be outsourcing it. So, um, I mean, it's, it, it, it's fundamental to, to who you are as an organization. And we look at purpose and impact um, and make sure we connect everybody to that work. And then one of the things that I think that organizations get tripped up on is, you know, and I was very cautious about this, in the creation of a sort of an innovation team, that it not be viewed as sort of an ivory tower structure where, well, they're the innovation folks. They get to work on all the cool stuff. And how to sort of create a connection back so that the folks um, that are today on the front line, you know, working with technology and the tools and the processes, that they, that they understand in such a way that, that what the folks that are working on innovation are really generating our next generation of infrastructure that will one day become the operational platform that the front line people will use. And creating this sort of two-way um, trust and understanding that, uh, and, and then the ivory tower, you know, that, that, that sort of risk that the folks in the innovation center realize that the people working in the field today on those tool sets that are serving uh, our patients and our customers in such a way are creating a platform that allow us to actually make those investments in the innovation space. So they're symbiotic to each other. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's taken time and learning and recognition, uh, uh, you know, as, as myself as a leader, to be able to get to that point. So, um, and it's very easy to trip up and fail. So coming back, I, I think any high-functioning leader in this space understands that they have to account for those things and that culture. I mean, the greatest tool we give our people and the greatest gift at the same time is the culture. And it allows them to make decisions um, you know, independently and, uh, and allows the organization to move forward. So um, culture, yes, important. It's everything. Terrific. Mike, I'd like to turn to you and have you comment on uh, the culture question. Yeah, it, culture is obviously very important for this. And, uh, you know, my perspective is that a lot of it, you know, you can hire the, you can hire the right people and put them in the teams, but I think a lot of the culture in this area comes from the top. Um, I think, you know, Randy was talking earlier about creating a safe space for people. Um, you know, a company may have a portfolio of different uh, innovation projects or new product initiatives or things that they're working on where they're trying to, to kind of push the envelope um, where they can afford to have a certain number of them fail. But if you think, uh, for example, if you had one person in your organization that was leading each, um, you know, how does that, how are people, you know, each person has one career. And so, you know, you, you need to make it safe for them to, to work on things where, you know, you're trying to attract high performers to come in and take on things that are inherently risky, but that sort of collectively will benefit the organization. And so, you know, making it safe to fail, rewarding people who, um, who lead something that didn't ultimately uh, result in, in the sort of growth or impact that you'd wanted to, but that did a really good job and caused the organization to take a step forward in terms of understanding or learning is, I think, really, really important. 
Um, I, I worked for an organization once where in the annual assessment, you know, you, you get rated on competencies, and one of the competencies was flexibility and adaptability. And when it, you know, described sort of what that competency was intended to mean, it was something to the effect of when confronted with, with change, changes that are happening, you know, how do you respond to that? And do you respond to it with a positive attitude or not? And I think that idea of pushing that responsiveness to change and people's willingness to, um, to react to change uh, in, a, in a positive way um, is, is also really powerful. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And I'm going to stick with you, uh, and mm -hmm. then we'll go to Steve and Randy. And let's talk about the different types of innovation. We talked a little bit in our pre-call. There's disrupting versus sustaining. There's internal versus external. Um, can you talk a little bit about the different types of innovation as you see it? Sure. You know, I think most people do sustaining innovation. Um, of course, disruptive innovation um, you know, made very uh, well known by the innovator's dilemma. Um, and it's something that I think absolutely people need to be aware of. There's disruptive innovation happening in a lot of industries, and it's almost like its own sort of use case in terms of how you um, address it in the organization and, and, and sort of handle it. it it's, it's kind of like a special case. I think most people that – most companies, most of the innovation they're focusing on is sustaining. But, you know, as I mentioned before, there are different ways um, to, 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 to approach innovation. You, know, you can have an innovation team that's doing the innovation. You can have an innovation team that's empowering the rest of the organization. You can do the overwhelming majority of your innovation in-house. You can work with outside partners. Uh, you know, we have a lot of strategic partners that we work with quite a bit and vendors where you know, we've developed close relationship over years where um, you know, we will go out, we'll visit not just with their salespeople, but we'll visit their R&D labs and talk to the scientists and the, and the product development people to see, you know, when we're looking at innovation at a theme park scale because of how long it takes to roll things out, I'm not as interested in, in what these companies are going to be able to sell me in 2017 or 2018, but what I'm going to be able to buy in 2020 or 2021 or what's going to be viable in those time frames. And so, you know, building those relationships, seeing the roadmap, being able to understand where things are going to the extent you're able to influence where things are going, I think that's very helpful. Um, and so, you know, having an ecosystem of partners is, is really good. Uh, you know, some, I don't remember who said this, but there's this idea that it doesn't matter what company you work for, most of the, of the smart people in the world don't work for your company is, is very true. And, you know, I think it, you need to be able to work with people outside. There's also um, a, a subset of innovation which is geared towards uh, working with your customers. If you have lead users and customer communities that use your product, adapt your product, uh, make customizations and stuff like that, um, there's a lot of companies that increasingly bring lead users in, into the fold or at least closely monitor them and align their, their products with, with what their users are doing or their customers. Um, and so you know, none of these things are necessarily mutually exclusive. And so it's just important when you're looking at doing innovation to think about what your different options are and which of these are the right fit for your company, your industry, your culture, you know, and, and kind of where you are. Great. Thanks, Mike. Steve, uh, we've got about seven minutes left. Could you take a couple minutes? And, and do you have anything to add to the sure. different types well, of innovation? I'll, I'll, dovetail what Michael's doing. Yeah, I'm a big believer in working directly with our customers. As I said earlier in the call today, we have a, a separate team called Customer Information Systems, and it's a combination of solutions architects and developers, and they meet directly with the customers. They, they visit their locations. They're constantly having interactions all the time. So that's more on the incremental side. Our home and strategic ventures, I, I would say that's that's more on a earth moving or, or some, somewhat earth moving side. And, and that's, that's working with strategic partners. And a big part of what we do too is we, we've also made it an investment in a venture capitalist fund. And what's great with this VC fund is we're getting optics into all sorts of different businesses, startups, mindsets. Um, we're learning maybe what won't, what won't work. And I think what's also important too as you're looking at innovation is maybe where and where not to bet the farm on. So we like the fact that we get optics through working directly with our, with our customers, our partners, 
but also looking at startup firms and seeing what they're doing as well. Thanks, Steve. Randy, uh, you have a couple minutes to add uh, to that uh, different types of innovation that you might categorize within your organization? Yeah, I think, I think and my colleagues have covered um, a lot. I think we, we have first, there's, you know, there is the innovation, and we also use, the, you know, this sort of this term in my, my mind, this concept of exnovation, where you're partnering with organizations, um, and as Mike indicated, and I think we both had sort of shared in the past this sort of the concept of realizing, boy, there's a lot of great, smart people that are outside of your organization. So part of what we want to be able to do is, if we um, if we want to develop something internally, the world may get there faster outside of us. So we may choose to also place a bet and work with someone, maybe even take a capital position um, in one of those organizations through our uh, uh, our equity venture investment fund. <clears throat> that's that's our own fund to be able to do that. And so, um, and so okay, coming back to that, you know, there's this concept of you know there's sustaining and disrupting. Um, I tend to look at things uh, maybe even sort of a little simpler, but this is concept we look at is, are you innovating inside your core competency, and are you also innovating outside your core competency? And understanding, um, you know, obviously the preferences and the tastes of what, what will happen in the market and your customers and understanding using data uh, around that will help you de-risk, help you make the right selections, uh, and help you position your organization for, you know, a tenure of relevancy, you know, beyond how you're structured today. Excellent. Thanks so much, Randy. And with that, we're going to go to our final thought moment. And Randy, we're going to kick it off with you, then to you, Mike, and then Steve, we're going to give you the final, final thought. Uh, so, Randy, if you could take a minute and just share with us a, a final piece of information that you wanted to have the audience, leave the audience with. All right. Well, I guess I'm reflecting back on the, on the conversation we just had. And what's probably really important for people is realizing that um, we all, our organizations and the individuals that work on, we all get stuck in our frames, you know, the day-to-day frames that, that we, that we, that our perspective is through today. And it's really important that you create a structure and a culture to allow um, opportunities and threats to basically be recognized and how can you immunize your organization against those uh, threats and adopt those opportunities by creating the innovation structures and the innovation culture for an organization. And that that's a responsibility that should be clarified, right? Where and how is that owned in the organization? If it's if there's not a lot of clarity around that, uh, it's probably time for the folks you know on the call here sort of drive that question to the right place in your organization. Thank you, Randy. Mike, your final thought. Sure. Yeah, if I could leave, you know, everyone on the call with with one thought, it would be that, you know, if you're somebody who's really interested in innovation um, or passionate about innovation, that innovation is, is actually a profession and a career path and uh, that there's an entire discipline and, and body of knowledge around it. Um, that was something I didn't really realize until a few years ago when I came upon this job and, and you know, got the word innovation in my job title. I spent the first 20 years of my career doing a lot of things that, you know, now I look back and think of them as innovation, but they were really sort of, you know, new technology type of, of opportunities and, you know, building up a set of skills and experiences for some, some future profession I would have when I grew up that I didn't really know what, you know, that I didn't really know what it was going to be and, and then discovered that, hey, you know, innovation, this is, a, this is an actual career path and something that you can do um, for a living and that, um, you know, increasingly companies are, are standing up or growing innovation teams and departments within them. And, you know, the need for people with the, the skills and the attitude to pursue innovation as a profession is only growing. And so I just, I just want to leave people with that thought that this is something that you can go out and pursue and, and, and do for a living. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Steve, uh, I'd like to give you the final, final thought. Yeah, real simple message here. Just invest in yourself. This way you can invest in others, and others will invest in you as well. I just think it's important to be a lifelong, lifelong learner and teacher. If, if you're going to innovate, it's get, gaining those skills. Have a good business background, technical background, leadership background, and be just a constant, constant learner. Innovation comes with trial and error and comes with lots of education. So that would be my, my message for the team. 
Excellent. Thanks so much, Steve. And at this point, I'd like to thank our guest, uh, Michael Molinari. Michael, I especially want to thank you for helping me develop this session and putting it together. Also, our other guest, Steve Heindel and Randy Gaborio. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. And thank you to Robin Kloss and our producer today and everyone who attended. The link to a short questionnaire is available on the screen now. It will be emailed to you within the next 24 hours. If you could take a moment just to fill this out and return it to us, we'd like to have your feedback. Thank you so much. I also want to invite you to attend our next webcast, uh, Bringing a Product Management Mindset to IT, and that will be featuring Martha Heller. And then our final webcast of the year will be Get a Grip on Blockchain. You're not going to want to miss that. So this concludes today's session. On behalf of the CIO Executive Council, thank you for joining us and see you next time.